This episode of the What If Podcast is brought to you in part by Button Poetry, where poetry isn't dead. As the premier place online for live performance videos of spoken word and slam poetry, Button Poetry won't bore you like your high school English textbooks did. Find real stories you'll want to listen to and art you'll actually care about by visiting them today at buttonpoetry.com. Welcome to the What If Podcast with your hosts, Spencer Worth Davis and Ryan Copperood. Oh, here come that bullshit! Do you know what a common artificial flavor, uh, artificial strawberry is made from an extract of beaver urine? I, how, do you, how do you get it? I don't know. I watched this crazy. How do you extract urine from a beaver? <laughs> gotta, well, dude, they milk, milk it. Yeah, they gotta you, just milk. Gotta, you just gotta wait for a while. <laughs> yeah. No, <it's laughs> Follow it around with a bucket. The, <laughs> it's happening! <laughs> and the whole industry. Oh, of, shit, I scared him. He's gone. <laughs> uh, scared the piss out of him. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, that's no. actually the technique is you have to frighten beavers. <laughs> Boo! Find the beavers, frighten them. Let's make it One. drink lots of water. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Just drop it off in a desert. <laughs> it's like, oh shit. How's the desert help anything? Because it'd scare the shit out of a beaver. It'd be like, where do I go? It's like, there's no water, there's no trees. What do I do? But that's like a slow I gotta chew on something scare. soon. <laughs> that's a slow scare. Yeah, fucking eat sand. My he, teeth are gonna be long as fuck when I leave. He would dehydrate before he even got around to like being scared. Hi, you're listening to the What If podcast. Hey, hi Spencer. What's up? We, we have got, guests. We today. have guests. You've heard them before. You'll hear them again. We promised one of them would be here last week. Bloop blap bloop. Now that's we got that guy. <laughs> Eric Mason is here. Bloopy bloop beep. And we got a bonus guest. Boner. <laughs> we got a boner guest. My <laughs> chance. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Name yeah. chance. Hey, um, this is the, the first time you've been on the podcast since the last time you were on the podcast. Oh, whoa. whoa. Right. Damn. But Coincidence. The, la- <laughs> the last time you were on the podcast, uh, some lady tweeted us and said that you your voice sounded like a drunk crackheads. <laughs> And this is your this is your first this is your, yeah, 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 yeah. This is your first opportunity to respond to her. So I just wanted to give you that. I'd like to say, Miss, I believe your your opinion is very short sighted, probably <laughs> steeped in a little bit of prejudice, and or maybe just being trapped in a very glass house. My bro, welcome to the party. <laughs> uh we're talking about what if you could be in two places at once. What if you were in two places at once? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, however you guys want to interpret that. Okay. I know we have a main interpretation. Do we? Well, I know we have a main interpretation based on a thing that I know you've been, uh, sh- shall we say, engaging in oh, there's, lately? There, there are layers, player. I, I've got many... Many adventures. Oh, okay. I okay. have been trying to uh, astrally project every day of this week, though, without success, oh. unfortunately. Mm. I don't know if I, uh, yeah. How? Okay, you're going to have to be a little more specific. Tell us what your your adventure into astral projection has looked like. Well, first of all, we should probably <laughs> tell people what astral projection is. That's probably a good idea. Do you guys have uh, self-definitions of astral projection? What does astral projection mean to you? Well, there are many different planes of existence yes. that we can conceive of or think about or entertain, and Michelle. we can focus our mind and our body in trying to imagine or exist in those planes of existence. One of those planes that our civilization has identified as the astral plane, which is sort of like the ether, the cosmic, the void, right? Am I close? I, I don't know if there's like a, a agreed upon definition of Just the astral plane away but, from this plane or yeah, above, above and, this plane. Well, and my understanding is that it's the one directly above this plane. So mm. there are m- many planes of existence. Sort of uh, people usually describe them sort of from low to high. Uh, the physical plane being the lowest usually, and then the astral plane would be one step above that. So mm. it borders ours out of the mud. Yeah, and it acts as sort of like a buffer between. Our physical realm and the higher realms of existence, mm. the more spiritual realms, and I can journey into it. So I, if I so wish, that is the presumed that, notion. That's yeah, 
That, according to some people, yes. Mm. So um, it, it's sort of like an out-of-body experience is, is maybe the best way to explain it. Sure. Um, which I guess we probably have to define that too. But yeah, basically you're, you're experiencing an environment different from the one that your physical body is in. You wave goodbye to your your meat form as you float away. <laughs> yeah, in the that's the grossest way you could possibly summarize that. Yes, here's hoping. Yes. It's my meat form, <laughs> <laughs> just growing and growing. That's terrible. Um, yeah, but you're you're separated from your physical body and you're able to experience something else. So astral projection is usually uh, you you can experience any other location. So it could be the next room over. It could be another country. It could be another planet. It could be a totally another, a totally different plane of existence. Can you project into another meat sack? Uh, uh, mm. No. Can I be your meat form? So, no. <laughs> so that, so, Not a bad Twitter line. <laughs> <laughs> hey, baby, let me get in that meat form. <laughs> Can I be your Jesus. meat form? <laughs> um... That it would make sense that if you're leaving your body, that it could be inhabited by someone or something else. Um, it's Isn't that like channeling, kind of. Yeah, except that's usually dead people uh, entering, so they don't have a physical form anymore. They're temporarily like speaking through a uh, physical form. Mm. Um, the way I've heard it described is that when you astrally project, so your your spirit or your soul, so to speak, is leaving your body and going somewhere else. You're still, because you're still alive, you're still tethered to that physical body mm. and you're conscious during this experience and you can re-enter your physical body whenever. So that's the difference between actually traveling and projecting because you're projecting out from a thing that you're anchored to. Correct. Cool. And different from if you were to die, you're actually leaving that physical body. Mm. Um. It's sort of like cut, cut the umbilical. Yeah, it's like the uh, the near death experiences or the out of body experiences we talked about, whatever that was a few months ago. Episodes sixteen and seventeen. If you haven't heard, wow, those yet. nice recall, pal. <laughs> um, Thanks. It's because people like that episode, so I, and I and I've recommended that one multiple times, so I know it's sixteen and seventeen. That's wow, <laughs> wow. Um, it's like that, except you're not dying. And the idea with astral projection is that you can control it and do it willingly through, on command. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, essentially Ish. through through meditation. Um, and a lot of people uh, use the the state kind of in between being asleep and awake, where your mm. body is physically asleep, but you're still conscious and alert, sort of yeah. like in a uh, similar to a lucid dream, right? And that's something we can get into more later, but it's like a, it's an intentional, uh, directed lucid dream basically. But some people believe that you're actually experiencing those things that are happening in that state. So what's been your experience with it this past week? And, and what do you mean by without success? Well, yeah, I want I kind of want to know like what you've actually been going sure. through phys like as a person. Yeah. So, like, how are you? Spencer's just standing in his yard, like, take me elsewhere! <laughs> Screaming at the sky. I want to leave. Your, neighbor, your neighbors are all selling their houses next week. They're like, I don't know what's going on in this neighborhood. Yeah, so I've been, uh, you start out, it's, it's basically just meditation because you have to physically relax first. So you, I'll lie down. Sometimes I've done it with, like, a guided meditation. Mm -hmm. Um you lay down in bed, you go on the couch, you go on the uh, floor. This floor right here, actually. Nice. Yeah. Um, cause the, the bed is is really conducive to just falling asleep. Sure. That it is. So, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. We've kind of trained ourselves to like that is what that's for. Right, right, right. So I'll do it like middle of the day when I'm pretty awake, not not in danger of falling asleep if I lay down and close my eyes for a while. Yeah. Um, you get really relaxed. And then the idea is to relax your body to the point where you're basically asleep and either through meditation or through following like a guided meditation, keep your brain alert. And so you're, um, intentionally inducing this, I think it's hypnagogic state. The cool word. That is a cool I word. I think that's I right. That word How'd you either. learn that word? <laughs> I've, been, I've been reading. Man. Uh, Damn, you're so smart. I should quit all the crack and start doing that. 
<laughs> you can do both, bro. Oh yeah, it's, I read fast. <laughs> <laughs> fast I sold all that's my that's books. <laughs> <laughs> you can, uh, yeah, you can induce this state in between being asleep and, and being awake, which is a thing that I've kind of always been fascinated with. I used to do a lot of lucid dreaming. I mean, it sounds like there's a ton of overlap. Yeah. All right, yeah. Like yeah. The, the overlap of being out of your form or at least able to control yourself in another sort of like general location right? The, I, I in a the, mid-sleep state. The two main differences are with uh, astrally projecting. You're not actually falling asleep. So it's not like you're, you're falling asleep and then doing something. You're trying to hit that like balance point between exactly between being awake and being asleep, and then um, disconnecting from your physical body. And which, I mean, we can get into later if we believe any of this shit. I'm not sure I do. Um, it's so <laughs> seems- you have you're speaking from experience, so you can speak on your experience. Yes, uh, I've I've had many lucid dreams before where basically you're awake. Or not, you're aware of the fact that you're dreaming and then can influence what you're doing in the dream. Um, doing astral projection is basically a step past that where you're intentionally creating that state and then intentionally going out and doing things that are supposedly in the real world. Mm. And so where it gets really interesting is that people have reported doing this and then being able to actually see or hear events that are happening in the real world, recall them and then report them back and have them verified mm. as actually happening. And that's, I, I that seems like a highly skilled like level of this practice. Cause I, yeah. I can, I mean, I, I can believe that by, uh, you know, practicing entering different, <clears throat> different states of consciousness, it changes your point of view and whether or not that's influencing the world around you. Like, I mean, some real time, like people reporting back what they heard and stuff. Someone is having lunch in it's, India right now. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's like I much saw only one person. Called said, it. Tikka masala. I heard it. <laughs> Sweet potatoes. <clears throat> no, but like, I, I totally, uh, I feel like everything is a practice. And the more that you do it, you reach states of, of uh, you know, experience. Mm-hmm. Because basically talking about meditation is more or less a waste of time if if someone can't relate experientially, if, the, if people can't be like, yeah, I know what you're talking about because the language surrounding the, uh, the other states of conscious, well, only the conscious mind is where words and stuff exist. Everything else is beyond words and, and really it's only like a feeling or an experience that you try to put into words. Yeah. So uh, with practicing that, you have more and more experience and that's, that begins to alter who you are, you know, the seer of of the world. So like, yeah, you can be like, I just astrally projected. So like the science would be who's monitoring this and how do you actually prove it's happening in real right. time or whatever. But, uh, the, does that even matter? It's like where it, <laughs> where it comes in. I, I didn't get to any, and I guess I, what I mean by like being unsuccessful with it is I didn't get, I didn't have any out of body experiences. I did have, um, I got to a point where I was definitely in the, like, the, the state between being awake and, and asleep where I was conscious and having thoughts and following along with this thing I was listening to, um, but not really aware of my physical being. Um, you know, I wasn't aware of like breathing or having physical sensations. Um, and actually when I like was coming out of it, I had, I guess what would be, like sleep paralysis for a few minutes Hmm. where yeah where i was awake and opened my eyes and i was like oh i don't think i can move right now i had to focus on for a few minutes on like slowly becoming more awake and alert and being able to like after a few minutes start moving around and sit up Hmm. that's a but i didn't travel anywhere like that's a very high level of of altered state yeah that's like achievable through through other but like practicing it i mean People report that all the time. And through meditation, when you reach different planes of <clears throat> towards samadhi or like bliss, it is like separating from the physical, the na- the natural ties to realize like the divine or or 
what's beyond or the spirit or whatever altered plane. You're getting into words I don't know, bro. Yeah. <laughs> you said samadhi and I'm lost. <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Samadhi is related to It's just crackhead shit Yeah you know You haven't smoked Jesus. enough rocks baby <laughs> Experientially let me tell you Tell you about it Samadhi <laughs> Samadhi uh, Okay uh, It just It basically is like the The highest uh, Chakra Or the high, Like the crown Chakra Which is oneness Where you see everything As the same thing So it's like Instead of seeing divisions Where it's like You end and I begin Or like I end right here and then it's air or whatever. When you remove yourself from that, then you see everything as like one. And it's basically just like zooming out to see a bigger picture. Mm. Um, So that's what samadhi is. And that can take, you know, an entire lifetime of seeking and preparing physically and mentally through meditation and, and breath work and all the things that you're doing basically. But that sleep paralysis is like a high stage towards that. Because Doesn't it also happen naturally, though? <laughs> totally. I mean, it's it's all... Are all of these altered states, quote-unquote? It's, ke- it's, like, more or less chemically induced, or, like, where is your awareness? Like, Yeah, I think that's the awareness thing. It's, like, making it a practice comes with... Like, if you want to be able to do it intentionally, it takes, it, it takes practice. Yeah. But I think... Yeah. I totally think you can do that by accident. Oh, yeah. You know? Like, I think any sort of, like, repetitive activity, you know, I think, like, riding a bike or going on a run or staring at a wall i think if if you're not thinking you are meditating we talked to we talked a little bit about this in our dreams episode but like i had a psych teacher once in school who made us all do dream journals for a while and i was really bad at remembering dreams which like wasn't a thing that i would come out like in the morning with and she was like every night before you go to bed take 15 20 30 minutes meditate on the concept of dream remembrance in the morning tell your brain and your body that you'll remember in the morning when you wake up and you'll get better at it and i was like that's bullshit like i can't control what my brain I, that like i can't you for sure set, can i can't I set say. my <laughs> no 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 I, I was like that's bullshit i can't set my my brain up to do something 8 hours later like I, my brain doesn't work like that and legit after like seven to ten days i was remembering my dreams more and more and more and it was just like all right shit and by the end of the semester i was like getting like i i could pull five or six different like scenes from my dreams in a way that i'd never been able to before but again it's just like it's going through a series of practices and meditation before you go to sleep that lets your body wake up and come out of it with that intention kind of like you're saying if you're at that point too you're really only Mm -hmm. a step or two away from lucid dreaming too because the first step is really just recalling them. That you're dreaming, yeah. Identifying that you're dreaming or, or yeah, remembering it. Is right. The first, first part of identifying. Yeah. Them. Yeah, just, just remembering them and then coming up with a like a, a system for like checking often if you are dreaming or not. And then you can start to like actually, once you realize that you are dreaming, then you can do whatever you want. So I still don't fully understand the difference then between projection and a lucid dream in the way that like if you're if you are in like an in-between sleep phase because like a lot of times i've heard people talk about lucid dreaming one of the best ways to lucid dream is by setting like an alarm for every 15 minutes while you're trying to pass out that just like like clicks it's like a click or something like that something Mm -hmm. just pops you kind of out of that state Mm -hmm. so to me that feels like that would be bringing you into that in-between world as well to lucid dream the the big jump I, was, I think I think from what I understand, at least uh, definition wise, lucid dreaming would be like you're actually influencing the world outside. Well, or sorry, projecting would be like you're you're leaving, while uh, lucid dreaming is just like I'm controlling this dream. Oh, I know sure. I know that lucid I'm dreaming. Dream, it's happening here. You're going into your own mind. Yeah, right. projection. You're going out into the universe. And yeah. astral is like whatever you're seeing as you travel is what's like actually happening in the yeah. universe. Did you guys ever see Doctor Strange? Yeah. I did. That to me was that scene in the in the hospital where he's like laying in the hospital bed and he's also like astral mm. projecting himself outside of being in the hospital bed and, and like he's like fighting, fighting that at the other same ghost time. and like it was visually well done. It was yeah. kind of slapsticky. <laughs> yeah. like it they was. kept knocking over like, cabinets and the doctors yeah. were right. like, "Ooh, what's going what's on happening? in here?" <laughs> but I actually the lights are flickering. Yeah. <laughs> but it was for me like conceptually to understand astral projection. Mm. actually kind of helpful <laughs> like mm-hmm. if somebody was like what the fuck is this shit because mm-hmm. right. it's like you are you he, they, like the, it was slapsticky but also like if you hit a wall 
in that room, but in another plane, you can still kind of affect it, but you're not like visibly there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know. The, the you know, it's a little fuzzy. So the can I can I give an example sure. of um, that I think will help draw a distinction between the two. This is from um, Robert Monroe's book Journey Out of the Mind. Sorry, Journeys Out of the Body, mm. which is one of the first uh, sort of mainstream Western. American books written about astral projection and out of body experiences. Um, he, it's mostly about his own experiences trying to induce out of body experiences. Um, and a few of the chapters are just journal entries from him. So this one is the book came out in 71. This one is dated, uh, September 10th of 1958. I'm just going to read it directly. This is just him like documenting his own personal experience. Yep. Okay. Um, he said, I floated upward with the intent of visiting Dr. Bradshaw and his wife. So this was his partner that he was working on with, uh, this study. That'd be one way to prove it. It's like hey, my partner, my, my partner, uh, he confirms it, man. He We're knew I, I, I popped toilet. up. I walked so, in the bathroom. All right. <laughs> hey man, I'm asleep right now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, check me out. I'm sleeping right now. <laughs> It's pretty wild, right? <laughs> Finish up that deuce. I'll see you at work tomorrow. All right, man. Peace. All right, let me tell my story. All right, go ahead. <laughs> All right. So uh, he has the intent of visiting Dr. Bradshaw and his wife. Realizing that Dr. Bradshaw was ill in bed with a cold, I thought I would visit him in the bedroom, which was a room in his house I had not seen. And if I could describe it later, could thus document my visit. It yeah. has a bed <laughs> and a dresser. And it looks like a room. There's a window. <laughs> and there was a dude in it. Called it. Sick. There's a sick guy. I brought you some astral soup, That's bro. Uncanny. <laughs> astral soup. <laughs> this is why we don't have four people on the podcast very often. I've read two sentences in about yeah, five minutes. Yeah, everybody quit being such an astral and let him tell a story. Let me tell my story. <laughs> uh, All right. That guy had steamrolled, but that was That's good. That's all good. Uh, astral. <laughs> okay, because it sounds like asshole. It's a, it's a funny joke. I love it, Mason. I love what you did there. Okay. Uh, again came the turning in the air and the dive into the tunnel, which is how he describes leaving his body. Whoa. What tunnel is he diving into? Uh, he, he describes when he, when he does this, he floats up out of his body and has to turn over to like disconnect. Cool. And Yo. then describes going through uh, like a bluish tunnel. Huh. Which is when he's leaving his physical body. Whoa. Um, at this time, I had the sensation of going uphill uh, as Dr. Bradshaw lived in a house five miles from my office up a hill. I was over the trees and there was a light sky above. Momentarily, I saw a figure of a rounded human form seemingly dressed in robes and a headpiece on his head. Uh, people will often describe encountering other people in the astral realm or the astral plane. Whoa. Um, it's traffic. <laughs> most most often kids because I guess kids, more connected. kids will do it accidentally yeah. sometimes and not realize it, which might be why kids have creepy ghost stories and by the time you become an adult, you don't. Mm-hmm. Um, so we saw uh, some other guy. Hmm. Um he says, I don't know the meaning of this. <clears throat> After a while... The- <laughs> <laughs> I'm lost too, buddy. <laughs> After a while, uh, the uphill feeling faded, and I came upon... Um- oh, sorry. After a while, the uphill travel became difficult, and I had the feeling that the energy was leaving, and I wouldn't be able to make it. When I had this thought, an amazing thing happened. I felt as if someone had placed a hand under each arm and lifted me. And I felt a surge of lifting power, and I rushed quickly up the hill. I then came upon uh, Dr. Bradshaw and his wife outside of their house, and for a moment I was confused as I had reached them before I got to their house. I didn't understand this because Dr. Bradshaw was supposed to be in bed, uh, but he was outside. Dr. Bradshaw was dressed in a light overcoat and hat, his wife in a dark coat and in all dark clothing. They were coming towards me, so I stopped. They seemed in good spirits uh, and walked past me without seeing me in the direction of a smaller building like a garage. I floated around in front of them, waving, trying to get their attention, but without result. Then, without turning his head, I thought I heard Dr. Bradshaw say to me, Well, I see you don't need my help anymore. Thinking I had made contact, I dove back into the ground, returned to my office, and rotated into my body and opened my eyes. 
Everything was just as I, as I had left it. Um, the vibration was still present, but I felt I'd had enough for one day. He describes, and a lot of people describe feeling a like a physical vibration. Mm, like um, when you get off a trampoline. Dude, I used to feel this when I was a kid. <laughs> eh? Mm, I have a wild. very weird recurring memory dream of during the, this is kind of freaking me out. When right. I used to fall asleep, I never used to be able to put my my finger on it. Because it wasn't like an experience or like a memory. It was more of like a memory of a sensation, but it was almost like this mm -hmm. like thrumming, like buzzing, humming feeling with like a warm light. Dude, I have like that's a, exactly what people describe, man. Are you serious? Yeah. Oh, it's freaking me out. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say again. Like, I was about to say that people often feel a warm sensation too. I have a very vivid memory as a child. You were traveling, bro. Whoa! <laughs> what, dude, what, uh, that's fucking me up right what now. What fucked me up? I got like chills when you were talking about how like he was uh, describing leaving his body and like flipping over. Yeah. Like that shit when when you're like in super, super meditative, my only experience recently, like is involved at like a shavasana after yoga, you just lay still mm -hmm. and your body's like humming. Pose. Yeah. So for a while, when I was practicing like every day and getting a shavasana and it just became like, I, I thought I was falling asleep. And then after a while I talked to my teacher, he's like, no, nah, that's, that's like good. Like embrace that. And it's totally like the same thing. It's, it's not that you leave. It's not that I don't know I'm just laying in this room, but like n new people arrive and it's like there's there's like interactions and stuff, but it's definitely like a disorienting flip of like gravity because mm -hmm. it's not it's it's no longer like you're laying on your back. It's just like it leaves and it it's like, yeah, gra like gravity yeah. changes, you know, like flips over. And like I, I was like, damn, one of the things that mm. uh, I'm pulling from a couple different books uh, for this, one of which, and we can put them in the notes too, one of which is called Astral Dynamics by Robert Bruce. Um, and one of the things he suggests is thinking of and trying to induce like a falling sensation. Cool. To help uh, like expedite or expedite that, uh, that disconnect. Anyway, to finish up that story, when he woke up, he called Dr. Bradshaw and asked what he and his wife were doing that afternoon. And Dr. Bradshaw said uh, that at roughly 4.25, they had walked out of the house towards their garage. They were going to the post office, and he had decided that perhaps some fresh air might help him feel better. And he had dressed and gone outside. Um, they got back by about 5, or sorry, about 4.45. They had, he had come back from his astral projection trip at 4.30. So it would have been the exact time that they were walking in the direction that he saw them walking. He then asked what they were wearing and confirmed that they were wearing the same clothing that he saw them in. Why didn't, uh, why didn't he tell them what he saw first right, instead so of what asking were you them exactly ah, yeah. what they were doing? <laughs> well, sure. I mean... This whole story is dependent upon his, uh, yeah, his Monroe story. not lying to us. Right. His right. truthiness. I mean, it, yeah. We, we can for sure question the validity of this story, but if he's making up the part about the clothes, then he might as well be making up the whole thing. Uh -huh. So, yeah. Sure. Question him. Absolutely. But I just think if I ever had that vision, I would call somebody and be like, I saw you wearing a tan jacket at 430 outside your house. Whoa! Rather, am I right? <laughs> and, then they, and then have that person yeah. confirm it. Right. Rather than like, oh no, he called me and asked me what I was doing and I just confirmed it. Sure. All, <laughs> all I'm saying is that all three of these people could be fictional for all we know. Mm -hmm. Right. I, mm -hmm. So, yes, that mm -hmm. probably would have been a better way of verifying it with these people that maybe are real people. I, that's sweet though. I have but that's, weird... that's the big distinction between this and lucid dreaming is that you're observing the actual world or outside of our world as it is probably in real time. Yeah. I, the clothing thing is weird for me. Not the observation of real world clothing, but like passing a dude in the astral plane who's wearing something. Cause like, I'm like, why are you wearing it? Like, how do you actually project your well, outfit? Your outfit. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking that too. It's like, if you were making a scene of a movie, 
It's like, hey, I'm in the dream world, and you just float past a guy that's wearing pajamas yeah. in, yeah. in like a sleeping right. hat. Like, <laughs> maybe it's like your consciousness is witnessing another consciousness, and our only way of comprehending other consciousnesses is in a body wearing clothes. Yeah, so yeah. That what you're actually or, experiencing is another floating entity, like another person or something. But our only way of perceiving people is as bodies clothes. with clothes. Could, on. could it also be that you're subconsciously projecting? your image of yourself. Sure, yeah. Because we don't know if, if of how he observed this other person is accurate. And I w- whatever accurate would mean in that situation, but maybe because in uh Bruce's book he talks about mo- you never see old people. And his his in hypo- the plane. Yeah, his hypothesis is that people project themselves at a younger age. Yeah. Like they always oh, be. interesting. That you don't you, you don't want even as you get older you don't think of yourself as being old huh. people usually project themselves at their like healthiest stage in mm. life unless they're kids because kids so, don't have another reference point right and they're usually not doing it intentionally they're just oops oops, oops some astral floating. plane oops, yeah some floating it's yeah another reason why kids could be good at it is because like the understanding of reaching these higher planes or just understanding uh consciousness better the more you L- live this physical life you have more and more memories and your and your brain is becoming more rigid and trying to create shortcuts and mm-hmm. um basically just not paying attention the same way that it used to and th- those experiences are actually the obstacles into the it's like the thing keeping you from from bringing things together or remembering this this like altered consciousness that is normal for kids or whatever like well, and my if, kids sleepwalk all the time. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, <laughs> what are you? What are you talking about? Like, yeah. man, they'll be like trying to reach and like put something on a shelf that's not there and stuff. And I'm like, that's crazy. Do they yeah. chat in their sleep? Yeah, sometimes. I you, it makes me think about too if if you believe in the concept of like a soul and that consciousness. And this is a bigger conversation I want to get into about consciousness and where it comes from and what it is, but. If you if you think of the the concept of a soul and that it was existed somewhere before it was in your physical body, right. as a kid you're going to be closer connected to whatever that something and somewhere else is, and maybe would retain some subconscious memory of that. It's like that residual vibration. Is yeah, that, and the, the same idea with like kids who talk about experiencing past lives or have memories of someone else's existence. Maybe you're just closer tied into wherever it is that we are before we're born and after we die. Mm. Yeah. I, I sort of subscribe to the idea that consciousness is not created inside of our brains. But it's, it's like beamed in. Or... We are a vessel that is connected to something else. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I guess beamed in is, is a good way of putting it. Yeah. Um, into our meat forms. Into Stop. this meat form. <laughs> We get it, bro. <laughs> I like it. it makes Animating me this meat that makes, form. That makes one of us. <laughs> yeah. I would say, uh, yeah, yoga philosophy is that. It, only instead of being like a bunch of separate souls, it's just one. It's just one consciousness that is mm. reflecting off of all, of all of the things, you know, like us as well as other aspects of nature. I feel like human consciousness is like the biological equivalent of lucid dreaming. And mushrooms. Like all other animals are like just kind of dreaming and we are the first people to like be lucid living. Mm-hmm. We're like, oh, we can mm-hmm. kind of control this. Yeah. You know? That'd, that'd be a great way of putting it. But don't... Mm. Yes, meat form, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> I was just having, I was just having a thought about wishing that we could, uh, wishing we could like watch animals' dreams. Yeah. Mm. Like what do animals dream about? Squirrel. Running, <laughs> they do, and you know when your dog does that weird thing where it like just kicks its leg or uh-huh. whatever. Oh, what do we dream about? Shit that we do usually, right? Mixed up with other shit that we do, mm-hmm. right? Right. Probably the same, I guess. Food and I left my body once in a really extreme way when I was tripping on acid. Can we talk about that on this podcast? How, how did we not? Well, o- why wouldn't how did we, we not open with Mason's story <laughs> about say, leaving his body? We knew it was I mean, going if here. If you want to talk about it, I we can talk about it. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't try to. But take it, acid or leave your body. I tried to take acid. I didn't try to leave my body. Okay. It was like after a really intense trip, and we had all like endured this crazy storm that we didn't know was coming, and uh, 
I, we were sitting around the fire eating apples. And I just sort of let my mind wander. And I remember like, like go, going above the tree. And you know me, I'm a very, like, I don't really fuck with out of body experiences. I'm like, I'm a super like skeptical person. But I just found myself just like rising above the tree line. And like, like, and it's, you know, like imagination. I'm just imagining. And I go into the atmosphere and like I break the atmospheric barrier into the stars and into the black. And I'm like going through the cosmos and I'm like looking at the planets in our solar system and like nebulas. And I just get further and further out. And eventually I find this like star and I'm going towards the star and the star has a solar system and the, the, I choose one of the planets and it looks kind of like earth. I'm like, Oh, I'm going to go check that one out. And I see this continent and a forest and I slowly go below this tree line and I see a little fire and around the fire are these like ape looking creatures all eating apples. And I realized it was us, but no one looked like people anymore. They all just looked like apes eating apples. And it blew my fucking <laughs> mind. And I just started laughing hysterically, you know, like one of those things where you like shoot out and it just gives you this perspective of like just a bunch of apes who just fucked their minds up. And now we're all sitting around yeah. eating apples, but it took like leaving myself for a second to like gain that sort of perspective. Also, doing sensory deprivation tank was the was the, was the other time Ooh, that I that makes sense accidentally slipped. I just slipped underneath myself and like Whoa. saw myself floating from below myself. See, this is so funny to me that you started this story by saying that you're the most skeptical and you don't believe in out of body <laughs> well, experiences, and, and maybe, you even laughed when you said out of body experiences right. on some woo woo shit. Well, and here's, and here's, you have two of the cleaner ones of anybody in this room. Well, and maybe maybe what I should do is be more specific about my skepticism. My skepticism is rooted in what is the difference between imagination and astral projection. Right. Yes, I can, is, I can imagine myself outside of myself. That doesn't mean that I am somehow outside of myself. Sure. I can imagine being away from myself as we all can that doesn't mean that i can independently verify things that are happening on the other side right. of the planet were there any uh, with any accuracy? verifiable details Definitely. of ape mason <laughs> the know. apples were eaten <laughs> at the end of this <laughs> i mean that would be the real kicker you could be like i went to tulsa oklahoma in my mind and i saw this person who i think is named amy working at a diner and I'm sure there is someone named Amy working at a diner in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And she just heard this and yeah, shit her mind pants. is blown. <laughs> <She's> a, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Send us an email, Amy. <laughs> You're talking about me. But I guess leave, that, leave chance out of it, though, please. <laughs> yeah. That's that's what yeah, I'd be I'm interested in. Yeah, I'm not doing good on is, the uh, how you, feedback. <laughs> how do you differentiate between what? imagination and again? We've been talking about children a lot. Obviously, children have very active imaginations, way more right. than us, like dull adults do. Sure, but you know, I, I would wonder what's the difference between, you know wondering and imagining and, and visualizing things and actually traveling, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think you're to your point and to your story from the journal, like it is, I, I share your skepticism around that story too, but like it is, it is the crux is always, can you verify it? Like did something happen that you can. Right. And people have tried to do studies that. around that exact idea. Um, like they would have, someone in a room trying to create a, uh, an out of body experience for their, for themselves with the instruction of in this other room down the hall, there's a card with a number on it. Mm. Tell me what number it is. Mm -hmm. And the whole time they're being recorded, observed in this room and then trying to get back, you know, after an hour or whatever, be like, Oh, it was nine, seven, two, five, three, one. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, I haven't done much research on it, but the government was doing like uh, remote viewing and like developing people that had, you know, what they described as ESP or extra sensory capabilities. Yeah, we did a whole episode about that. Right. Yeah. So like, uh, do you got any good data from those? Everything I've always found has been super, well, first of all, it's always, it's always uh, anecdotal. It's yeah. one of those really hard and things to verify, I, I would think. Right. But right. even in the in the setup I gave with the the num the card with the number on it, you know, the the outcome of that was the guy, oh well, I couldn't I couldn't get to that room, but I found this other room and I can describe it in this way that's accurate. So I didn't do exactly what you wanted, but maybe I can also verify that I was indeed out of my body. Um, and they also had them connected to uh, 
uh, what, what are the things you stick on your head to measure your brain waves? Oh, yeah. Uh, a little electrical EKGs? impulse, guys. Is that hard? EKGs for your heart. <laughs> I don't know what those are called. EEG, uh, maybe? A couple, yeah. uh, couple letters. <laughs> <laughs> we anyway, know what you're talking about. We've all seen movies. <laughs> um, they were They were tracking his brain waves during this time, too. And he said, coming out of it, yeah, I, I had an out-of-body experience, but it wasn't, I couldn't sustain it for long enough to do what you guys wanted me to do. I think it was probably only about eight seconds. And he had a huge dip in his brainwave activity for eight seconds at the exact time that he said he did. Mm-hmm. And his pulse and his blood pressure dropped for about eight seconds. Mm-hmm. So it's always stuff like that where it's like, well, there are other explanations. and, and maybe- But at some point, the simplest explanation might be that he did what he said he did. Right. Right. And and like, then you can get into the like, the question. Besides the application of like, oh, we want to go spy on somebody. It's like, does it really matter? <laughs> like, if somebody imagines that they do it, it's changing that person for the rest of their life. You know, because of the way that they view reality, and that that in turn like manifests an alternate path for that person at least. I think, so like what's the unless you're trying to our, spy on somebody our why does it matter? Our, our understanding of the the capacity of the human mind and the abilities of the human mind that have yet to be unlocked. I think that really matters. I think that the skills that we might possess and the since neuroscience is so young still, like the the quality of our mind and how how limited we may be and like how many more skills we might possess. I feel like that could that could lead to a huge expansion of human culture and civilization if we really understood, you know, emphatically what we what we really could do, what we really could be. Right. You know, but if we could say I, I totally agree, but like what is what is the what is the government trying to use it for? What's the application? Oh, yeah, what's sure. the application of the of to the sell thing? Sell you, Coca-Cola. you know, because really all like all it Steel is doing, yeah. elevating your own consciousness. It's just bringing you closer to other people. It's making you more sensitive. It's making you more part of something instead of separate from it. So if the studies are like, can you go spy on this thing? And that's all that they're really looking for. And that's the real application of, of, of that, you know, like that's what I'm asking. It's like, does it, does it matter if it's really real or if there's no conclusive evidence from those things? It's making those people, it's changing those people. Cause they're, they're like now with that experience of, I can like leave my body and sh- you know like right. It's it's a transform transformative experience personally. Right. I think what Mason's saying is that if we could confirm that those transformative experiences happen objectively, mm-hmm. that then more people could experience it, mm-hmm. and you would have, you know, if, if everyone had that experience, how different would everyone's interactions be? And I think from a from a government and like military level, that would be really dangerous because if everyone had sympathy and empathy and realized that they were connected to each other and what I do influences a bunch of other people, then our whole society breaks down. Yeah. <laughs> like our society yeah. is based on greed and selfishness. Well, I, think, I think that's partially why why a lot of like big governmental agencies are afraid of things like LSD or the internet. Totally. That Absolutely. It's like totally. That, that is a version of projection. You're like, I'm going to leave this reality and discover new truths that, you know, have nothing to do with the stories, real that world so conservative good. politics. Right. That it has everything to do with my, my reality that I create for myself and my community. Yeah. You know, like it's the ability to access something that could make you think or believe or feel something other than what and connect you with people doing. on an independent level that's not controlled by an outside entity. Right. Reality hits you hard, bro. <laughs> Woo! Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> one of the, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, no, I you go. lost my train of thought. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you go ahead. Uh, Did you simultaneously <laughs> interrupt him and forget what you were saying? That was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I need to, uh, shit. ESP. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things about this whole, uh, did you just remember it yeah, as I started I talking? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can hold it. If you if you need oh, it, okay. I can hold this it. This is good okay, radio. So, All right. so basically we're talking about if people could do that, what what would we do with all this science and shit? Well, the science is there. Like you said, you can follow a step-by-step thing to put yourself into that thing. Like into a state of maybe something happening that you, that the, 
us in this room can because we already are like down to experience some weird shit and realize that things are not always the way they look. Right. So just but the technology is there. It's the people that have to do the work, you know, do the practice that would achieve those things. And like having conclusive evidence may, might coax more people there, but there kind of is a library of conclusive evidence that you can change your experience uh, in this physical being by meditation and, you know, breath work and body work and shit like that. But like what Mason is saying is all of those things that can get you to that point if you listen to our society as a whole, tell you that those things are bad. somewhere between <laughs> bad, yeah, illegal, illegal, and yeah. stupid. Right. Or insane. Or some combination of, of the four, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So you kind of already have to be there to get there right now. Yeah, so like how much science does it take for them to like all of a sudden just like legalize weed? They've known for a long time that it doesn't do those things and it's a story that they keep on selling or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean... That's the thing. Like facts, facts, and like information is still not going to change a paradigm. Are you sure? This is well, kind of along the same lines of what I was actually going to say, though, because this is this is a thing that I struggle with as it relates to whenever we come across a topic like this that is sort of otherworldly. Is like we look for evidence based in this world, in this tangible world and universe that something has happened outside of this world. Or, or not necessarily outside of this world, but like outside of our understanding of how the mind works. Mm. And I always struggle with that. Like we, we look for evidence in the ways that we understand how we collect evidence to be evidentiary of something we inherently do not understand. If the human mind was so simple, we could understand it. Kind of, we, yeah. We'd be so simple. Like we, we go, oh, can you leave your body? Well, can you prove it to me by moving a book in the next room? You know, it's like, mm-hmm. but maybe that's not the right like level of evidence we should even be trying to look for. For, like who fucking knows man I won't be the, I'll never be the first person to tell you that you didn't go fly around to go find a new star with some apes eating apples on around a fire mm-hmm. in a whole nother universe like but, yeah you might have also just been tripping but I I don't like I don't I'm not gonna be the guy that's like that was just a hallucination like, I mean and I was definitely tripping yeah <laughs> <laughs> that was an element of the of but the, you experienced it you know it happened it really it. happened to you and I guess to, in my, I what really, I'm trying to say, I really imagined it. Yeah, I, <laughs> right. Well, right, and and that, but that's kind of like I guess what I'm trying to say as it relates to what you're saying, because I think not to speak for you, Chance, but I kind of feel like part of what you're getting at is that whole idea of like if this changes something for me individually or personally by having an experience similar to this, does it matter whether or not I imagined it or whether or not it like happened in the astral plane in the way that we're talking about it right now you know is it measurable or did it was it meaningful to me psychologically one way or another and i and i totally feel that angle but i also feel the skepticism angle that requires there to be some sort of evidence that says it's not just me sitting in my mind and and imagining going to the bathroom right now which i could i could sit here and do and i think this is this is why it's it's so strange to me that a lot of times the spiritual realm and the scientific realm get pitted against each other. Yeah. Because I don't think they're trying to achieve anything similar. I think there's two totally different truths yeah. mm-hmm. that people are attempting to seek. You know, like you, what you're talking about is, does it make it more or less meaningful? It's like, no, absolutely not. Yeah. Does it matter if it really happened? Absolutely. Yes. I mean, it, does it make it less meaningful if it, quote, didn't really happen? No. I mean, it's obviously meaningful. That experience can change you forever. Absolutely. Just like listening to a song, you know, having dreams, you know, you can imagine many meaningful things. You you read a fictional book. Didn't really happen. Does it change your life? Absolutely. Right. It's definitely meaningful. But would it matter if Lord of the Rings really happened (laughs) somewhere? (laughs) Yeah, that would fucking matter. That we would want to know that. That would affect the way we live in the world and that would affect the way our future would turn out. It would matter. We would be able to use that that knowledge to affect our future. Yeah. Not that you can't use it if it's imaginary, but if it if we could somehow establish empirically that yes, you can view things on the other side of the planet, or, or yes, there are tree people, and or yes, yes there are ants, or yeah. yes, the Eye of Sauron might incinerate us all. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that I, would uh, definitely matter. It does matter. We um we got to take a quick break here because uh, uh, yeah. sure, we're very sure good at doing this whole conversation thing. We've got a little long for a break, but we're gonna do it. We're gonna we're gonna take a quick break. And we gotta take a break because we're fucking we're awesome. We're so <laughs> modest. It's time for a break from all the modesty. No, I just man, we've all gone almost an hour now talking uh, with without taking a quick pause. So y'all take a breather. We'll do the same. We'll meet you right back here in a second. 
Sometimes it's not your night, man. <laughs> This episode of the What If Podcast is brought to you in part by Button Poetry. Check them out right now by visiting buttonpoetry.com. Button Poetry is nothing like the traditional poetry you heard in high school, and they're certainly not the same old, boring, dead guys that are going to put you to sleep. Button Poetry features poets of all ages, races, sexual orientations, and backgrounds, and as a poetry press and an online destination for spoken word and slam poetry videos, Button Poetry publishes poetry that moves people. They believe that real current stories and real current voices are more necessary now than ever you know everyone says changing the world with art is impossible but at button poetry they're sure going to try so check out everything they have to offer there's books there's videos there's commentary there's learning there's education there's so much stuff uh, that you can get by checking them out at buttonpoetry.com today you will fall in love with poetry all over again or maybe for the very first time You guys want to know a crazy fact? Yeah. In Norse mythology, uh, Vardöger is a ghostly double who precedes a living person and is seen performing their actions in advance. Read about that. Wait, say that again. In Norse mythology, uh, Vardöger is a ghostly double who precedes a living person and is seen performing their actions in advance. By that person or by other people? So by like that person. Five Whoa. minutes before oh, you showed up at my seen house, that in a movie. I, I would have seen you walk in and say hi to me and come sit down in here. But wait. And then five minutes later, you would have actually done it. Finnish oh. mythology has a similar one called an et, et, etainen, which translates to a first comer. So, Whoa. okay, yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> so it's someone else perceiving it, you're saying? Yes. Yes. Because I was thinking, I was thinking of like, you see yourself like go through these motions and then you do it. I was thinking like a Donnie Darko or like mm. some, some type of like thing where you're watching yourself do it before it happens. Like yeah. that's like, that's your calculating mind. Like this is what I'm going to do next. You actually like see right. yourself I think do it. in what Ryan's talking about, it's someone else observing you doing something. Right. That's, that happened to me the other day when we hung out at Pimento. Yeah. Where Remember when I was like, Keezy, I saw someone drive by that. I was like, or bike by, I was like, that looks like DJ Keezy. I'm pretty sure it wasn't. But then you came in, and then like a minute later, actual DJ Keezy bike yeah. by. You saw like, a first oh. cover. Ver, verboten, or what What are they? Vardoger. 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 Yeah, you saw Vardoger <laughs> Keezy. Vardoger. I'm really questioning your accent on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Look, man, here's what I'm going to say. Norse equals it's Scottish. Not, yeah. <laughs> it's not racist Vardoger. if Ryan does it. Scan, scan the donkey. Scan donkey, I'm an ogre. <laughs> Uh, Look, guys, it's Scandinavian folklore, all right? If anybody in this room gets to fake a Scandinavian accent, it's, this dude it's here. me. This is Viking-ass looking motherfucker. <laughs> oh, Viking face ass. <laughs> looking boy. Oh, looking boy. Horn helmet looking ass boy. <laughs> um, you guys know about doppelgangers? That's jerk. actually how, so I was going down uh, a Wikipedia K-hole around <laughs> doppelgangers. I which, was thinking about K-holes the whole time of that story, walking uphill. The fuck is a K-hole? K-hole ketamine. is when you take ketamine and everything is uphill all of a sudden. So you see people walking on a flat what surface. What's that to do with Wikipedia? Sometimes they refer to it as like a K-hole if you get like kind of lost in like a, a climb, trip. basically like a trip. Mm. They call it like falling down a K hole, basically. Like that dude who was astral projecting and said everything felt like it was uphill. I was like, that dude just took ketamine. Uh, <laughs> right. He been taking ketamine. <laughs> then he came back with information from the other side. <laughs> from the other side of the K hole. Yeah. <laughs> um, what you know double, about double walkers? Double walkers. Yeah, is, is that, that like what double collect means? Yeah, yeah, translation. Yeah. Yeah. Or double collect. I, I saw a double goer also, which would make sense with it's less the, poetic ga- ganger. <laughs> <laughs> right. Double goer. You see, like, that's called the same time. two diamond. <laughs> <laughs> I like double guy. Don't act like you're offended by that meat sack or whatever you were Who? calling us. Meat earlier. form. Dude, meat meat form. sack is worse than meat form. <laughs> yeah, well, a sack full of meat is you're way welcome. worse. You earned it. <laughs> <laughs> With endearment. With endearment. Um, I found a couple, or at least one good doppelganger story. I think. Let's hear it. If I can find my my notes. 
on the on the internet. Show notes. Uh oh yeah 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 Emily uh, Sajay. Oh yeah, her. You know well, Emily Sajay. Yeah, you know Emily Sajay. She's oh, got a no, tight way of spelling Emily. It's em- Emily E M I L I E. She from L A. No, she's from France. <laughs> France. Oh, that explains France. it. Yeah. <laughs> she's from, from South Le, Central. Le France. La France. <laughs> Get it? <'cause>, God damn <laughs> it. <laughs> anyway, she was uh, she was a teacher, and prove it. I I can't I can't prove anything. <laughs> I just like being skeptical. You just made me question skeptical the, about every aspect. You just made me question the entire podcast with two words. <laughs> <laughs> like, why are we even here? What are we doing? <laughs> we're gonna turn that into a drop too. So prove every, it! <laughs> prove it! Even when Mason isn't guessing, we're just gonna say things, and he, we get his fucking skepticism. prove it! <laughs> I want to see the data. Uh, anyway. People, her students and like other teachers and her principal would report seeing her in places around the school where she was also simultaneously somewhere else. Hmm. Oh, you talk, she got, she had a twin. She had a, a doppelganger, if you will. Dude, I, have you I seen the prestige? Enough, I, yeah, actually that did come to mind when I was looking at doppelganger stuff too. I actually weirdly had a dream about this exact concept the other day with a coworker of mine who, it freaked me, it was like, Kind of nightmarish, but more like just like weird, like like not not nightmare like fucking I'm getting hacked to death nightmare, but more like disconcerting, uncomfortable. uncomfortable. And it was like I was in a room with a coworker. We were like up at a cabin. He was like, "All right, I'm gonna lay down and take a nap." And I was like, "All right, cool, man, sounds good." And I like went down to the kitchen to like go see who else was in the kitchen, and he was there. And I was like, "Oh, I I just saw you take a nap upstairs," and he was like, "Yeah, like." I am, and I was Wait, like, "What? Whoa! <laughs> like that's, it was, that's my second body, bro." Those are bro, dreams you it was, remember. It was, yeah. oh, it was a dream. Yeah, remember I the feeling? The part where it was a dream. <laughs> oh, I was like, Wait, yeah, that's very what? Important we got to unpack this. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I, it's just weird because uh, I don't know. Maybe I was being. Uh, maybe it, it was just all the reading that I've been doing this week about this stuff gotcha. was playing with my dream world, but. It was a disconcerting experience. Or maybe I woke up you feeling were kind of uncomfortable and maybe weird. you were projecting. I can relate yeah. in a dream, you know, just like uh I remember like I had a friend that died quite a while ago, but it was probably like a year ago or more, where I just like saw him in a dream. And it kind of became it was like I was like, you know you know you're not supposed to be here is what I said. And it like brought it like made me awake enough to be like this this is like strange. This is more than a dream or whatever. Right, like right. the feeling of it made me feel like, uh, you know, it was disconcerting. I was like, I got chills and I was like, you know, you're not supposed to be here. And I'm like, where am I? And I was like, right. was where like, is he? When I woke, yeah, when I woke here? up, I, when I woke up, that was, was very clear in my memory that yeah. that happened. And I just remember the, like, you know, you're not supposed to be here. That's yeah, crazy. So Emily was, Emily had experience, or I guess gave this experience to other people as well. Yeah, so at, at first it was, you know, somebody would see her in the office and at the same time somebody would be like, no, I just saw her in the classroom and stuff like that where it was like maybe she moved really quickly or somebody saw somebody else that looked like her right. or kind of based on what you were talking about with Keezy and seeing somebody that mm. probably wasn't her but just looked like her. Mm-hmm. And then in the middle of teaching one day, she's writing something up on the blackboard and an exact copy of herself showed up right next to her in the classroom. And everybody saw it? All of her students saw it. What year was this? What do you mean by show up? Just popped up? There was came in suddenly the room? a double of her standing like next to her. Right there. Yeah. Just boom. Do you know that, was, that was mimicking all of her motions. If you kind of look Crazy. cross-eyed, you can make two of somebody. <laughs> all of her students were drunk as fuck. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Steve, Stephen Hawking thinks that they're... So he, Stephen Hawking's a big fan of the string theory... Like uh, multiverse thing, yeah. And he thinks that if you so is Rick Sanchez, really? Mm-hmm. Okay, so is Ricky Rubio. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so gonna... is uh, yeah. Okay. Turn my microphone off. For a minute. <laughs> give him, give him the story I'm drop. Take, I'm gonna take five. So, give him the story <laughs> drop. So. Hey, let me tell my story. <laughs> there we go. But he he thinks that if you if there is a universe that is so similar to the universe that we're in, where the only difference is that. I was standing one foot to the left writing on the chalkboard versus yeah. one foot to the right that they can actually bump into each other and cross over sometimes. Yeah. And that he, he thinks like a lot of ghost 
sightings or like moments where you're like, I picked up the blue crayon, but now I'm holding the red crayon or whatever are just you sort of like bumping up against these hyper similar universes. I love that theory. I, I love that you can sort of like glimpse another universe where everything in all of the universe's history is exactly the same except for the fact that you were standing like half a foot to the left. Totally. We talked about this once in uh, in an episode, but uh, somebody brought up the metaphor of it being like books on a shelf and all of the books on a shelf are those, the closest book to the next book is the, you know, infinitesimally close except for one thing book mm. and that the covers touching is the moments where you can kind of maybe fall into did you find the left watch book Interstellar? or the right book. I did watch Interstellar. Okay. <laughs> I told you I watched Interstellar. <laughs> it's like, was that a quote right from that movie? No, no. We I talked about that in another episode, yeah. actually. Oh, okay. It sounds like Interstellar. I did watch Interstellar. I told you I watched Interstellar. I liked Interstellar. It wasn't like amazing, but I enjoyed it. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Spencer wants to tell us Emily's story so bad. No, I, I mean that that's basically the story. And and the, the whole concept of the doppelganger is usually seen by yourself. So if I I would see an exact copy of myself, and it's historically been viewed as being a very negative thing and sometimes a, a an omen of death. Is it like the evil twin sort of Yikes. idea? Yeah, or I, I I think maybe more the idea is uh like you're you're approaching some crossover point. Mm. Yeah, you know, so the same idea of people who are nearing death will often uh report seeing family members or loved ones who have died already. Um that maybe as you're nearing that that point, those lines that you're talking about get, get blurred, blurred mm -hmm. and you're sort of existing in both mm. at times. Mm. Um, but I don't, yeah, that's, that's sort of the traditional version of it. But when other, you know, there were 30 people who saw her exist in two locations simultaneously. That'd be, that'd be worth whatever the tuition was. <laughs> I think it was, I think it was public school. So they really got their money. Sort of. Damn. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I just realized we, we kind of talked at length about one version of being in two different places at once. And there are lots of variations on it. And like that is probably the one that people are most familiar with just because it has a cool name. Well, and it makes you wonder if there's if there's some sort of mechanism of like this is gonna be impossible to try to like sludge through this idea. But where you like where you shine a light through a prism and it's it refracts the light and splits it. Yeah. And then you're looking at one beam of photons that's being like multiplied in two places at once that behave exactly the same, which I think is I don't know anything about this, but I think is like the basis of the idea of quantum entanglement is that there's like something that has split these two streams. And by just because there was, they were one at, at one point and now they're being refracted that they behave exactly the same on opposite sides of wherever they're shining. Mm. So if you were to turn the light that's being refracted through the lens, both streams of photons would turn simultaneously and they would both be identical mm. Because you're, and it makes you wonder if there's, if there's a way that your perception or or perhaps like all of existence could be like refracted somehow. Maybe that has something to do with a, a dimension that's like a little bit beyond where we are, like yeah. some sort of time dilation or something like that. You know, like yeah, I'm, I'm like yeah, I'm we're trust, getting out there, bro. I'm trust, Go ahead. I'm trespassing on, on realms that I know absolutely nothing about. No, well, so, I, I but think you sound is, like an expert, though. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes we give birth to lies here, and that's like uh that's an okay <laughs> thing to do. Sorry, I was uh, I was ready to talk and not ready to push buttons, but like, you're you're right. Revealing ignorance. <laughs> but I was born. There it is. Timing is everything. There it is. Uh, I I think it is interesting to bring up quantum physics and quantum entanglement and action at a distance, even if none of us really are capable of speaking in any coherent way about it. Just because going back to the conversation we had before the break about where science and uh, spirituality or, you know, they're trying to answer different questions mm -hmm. and what would be the purpose of trying to objectively verify something like astral projection. Quantum mechanics is something that wasn't real until it was. Right. And now it's an accurate way of describing observable phenomena. And so 
you could kind of draw the comparison between something like astral projection or ghosts or any of this shit that we talk about until it, it's all nonsense until it's not the idea right. of two things on opposite sides of the world or the universe somehow being connected to each other and somehow having an influence on each other was total nonsense until suddenly it wasn't. Which is funny because even as we struggle to understand it, it still appears to be nonsense. Right. But we so just made does, up a name for it. Right. But so does so much of the universe. Right. It appears nonsensical until you just repeat it for enough decades where it becomes the truth. Well, and in a in a non-scientific way, that's what we've done with some of this quote-unquote paranormal stuff that we talk about. It's like, we just gave it a name. Yeah. We don't know what it is still. We don't right. know what a what a ghost or an out-of-body experience or a UFO or any of this. We don't know what that really means, but we gave it a name. Mm -hmm. We're just talking about how clumsy words are, too, and definitions. If your definitions of, an, of something is, is rigid you're already missing the majority of it. Right. Like, and just like, it, we're so limited by our language because like we we can say quantum mechanics. <clears throat> I don't, that doesn't give me any information about anything. Right. You told me what it's called. I have no more understanding than I did 30 seconds ago about what that actually means or what's and really, happening. really, that's just the name for something that is spooky and weird. Right. You're like, we just named this thing that none of us really understand. You know, it's still so far outside of the realm of like, being logical like that that double slit experiment i've heard a million people explain that experiment in a million different ways mm -hmm. and nobody understands what it means <laughs> I, i've or never how. i've never been able to wrap my head around that right yeah and i think that's like the cool part about it is that it's we're just telling that's like the confusion about science it's like a lot i think a lot of people think that science is this sort of like like uh industry that is like trying to tell you how the world is but it's not. It's really. It's a process. It's a, it's a mechanism. It's a method. <laughs> yeah, by it's one we, method of discovery by mm -hmm. which we try to find things that are repeatable. Mm -hmm. And the double slit experiment is repeatable, and it doesn't make any sense. We're not trying to tell you how the world is, right. other than like when you do this, weird shit happens. See, <laughs> and that's the you thing. The, as far like science keeps on pushing, and all it's creating is new questions. You know, and like that's what science is meant to do. It's like right. now we found out this. Now what doesn't necessarily change? Uh, like what the shit has been happening, you know, like whatever reality is, it's been happening, but now we have the words to describe it, which like, like you said, yeah, there's value to that. Cause now people can talk about it and maybe make new discoveries about it. Yeah. But, but sometimes I worry about that too, though, because like, I, I worry about like when you reify something, like when you take an abstract com concept and then you make it a concrete thing, then all things that could potentially be lumped under that category become that thing and all the baggage that naming it gave to it. Mm, so exactly. I'm always worried about that when it comes to these types of things where it's like, like all the things you said, you know, like we say UFO and like, if you really break it down an unidentified flying object is a very harmless like, just like, a, I don't know, I thought I saw something up there. Can't identify but, it. But when you say UFO in our society now, there's so much baggage that comes with that. So and realistically, like, it probably refers to hundreds of different things. Right. And But there's and, a story that pops up that we replay. We cut all the corners and say, that's what that is, as opposed to a neat package. And it, and it, right. the, so it simultaneously stops the curiosity about that topic. Too. Right. There's a, there's a story that I keep on like wanting to say. It's like, as soon as you, or like, this story was told to me, it's like, a little kid is like, daddy, daddy, look, like, mm. look. And and the dad's like, what, what, you know? And the kid's like, that, look at that thing, like, look at it. It's like, what, what is it? And he's like, oh, that, that tree right there? That's just a tree, come on. And then, like, mm. never again will that kid look at look at what that thing is in all of its like amazingness. Right. Dude, I saw this kid the other day walk up to a bike rack in the middle of Father Hennepin Park, point at it and just start laughing. <laughs> he just, he pointed at the bike rack and he was like, ha ha! <laughs> and his mom was like, it was high as what? And the kid just pointed at it like, look! <laughs> <laughs> just like look at this ridiculous item I know nothing about oh my god <laughs> the humor uh, you know, like, right. what? but then he I put a name on oh the bike rack the kid's oh, like yeah fuck that bike rack yeah, right. <laughs> shit's not even that funny but yeah I, try, try and describe a tree to somebody right well it's, yeah. yeah exactly cause it's 
many different things, many different right. experiences. It's a home. It's an ecosystem. It's and it's even those though. Cement. What the fuck is an ecosystem? Right. Every Explain word, an eco- ecosystem it, right. to me. Every word is a box to like really explore and undo our our programming or our conditioning is to find the space in between the boxes. Like make definitions again, less rigid. And again, it's like it's trying not to trying not to correlate too much the realms of spirituality and science. Like when you when people used to worship the sun, people still do, but the thinking of the sun as a god and then thinking of it as a ball of gas that, you know, turns hydrogen into helium, it's like just because you know the processes by which the sun creates certain chemicals or elements or knowing what happens inside of it, knowing what it is and knowing that it's similar to all the other stars in the yeah, universe. Does it not give us life? Yeah. <laughs> does it make it any less of a god? Does right, it make it any right. less worthy of your worship? If it, if it went away, wouldn't we all vanish? Right. Is it not the thing that gives us all life? Right. Absolutely. And is responsible for everything being here in the first place? Can't it both be a burning furnace of gas and a God right. simultaneously? Inclusive definitions is like the goal. Like inclusive because it's, it is all these, it is more than just this one thing. And like that's, yeah. I mean, I, I just and, had and a, that's the in best. some ways calling that a God is more descriptive. Sure. Well, that's just describing... because we have a lot of fucking baggage with the word. Well, because you're God. describing not only the processes that it uses, but also all the benefits we receive from yeah, it. The, the outcome. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I think that goes, that's like a perfect illustration of what you were talking about earlier. When like we talk about religion and science being at odds with each other and why not both sometimes? Yeah. Well, somebody was saying, I don't know. I don't I think follow. It's a, it's a problem of definitions. It's right. like a, it's a contradiction in terms to think think of different types of truth. Right. You know, it's like the type of truth you can get from reading, you know, Shakespeare versus right. the type of truth you can get from reading an encyclopedia. Right. They're not the same. Right. They're not the same t- types of truth. Right. You know, the totally. word truth is too vague for all of us to agree and have an axiom to y- to build around. And yet they're equally valid. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't I don't have any great uh like concrete examples, but I've heard like quantum physicists when they reach new questions and stuff, they go they bring them to like mystics and like mm. holy people and like monks and shit and discuss these things to get more ideas. The, the so line like there's between more science, than ever, yeah. The like, line between science and philosophy has always been really interesting. To me. Art science. Yeah. The using words is art science, you know, there's a science to it, there's an art to it. I think it's it. arrogance to think that mystics aren't scientists. Totally. It's like that is a type of science. You yeah. you are repeating an experiment mm-hmm. to try to come to repeatable results. And You're trying the, to build common vocabulary and experiences between people that you can repeat that the, is science and the stu- it's the su- study of self basically and like your own experience if you can't speak on it from your own experience it's basically just regurgitating what you read or someone else's experience but truth that holds you know gravity is something that's been experienced and can be discussed in those terms so it's like from your you can somebody can tell you the grass is greener on the other side but until you lived it, you know, until there's an association from your own experience, you won't really believe that or even have. And I think that's that what you just said, to be able to experience it is the beauty of scientific axioms versus dogmatic axioms. Yeah. That if you tell somebody, you know, this is an experiment you can perform in a vacuum dropping a feather in a bowling ball. Regardless of the language you speak, your gender, your race, your culture, your age, you can do that experiment and come to the exact same results. It's not something that dogma possesses. Dogma tells you what it is, whereas science tells you, here's how you can discover how it is. You know, here's the processes you can use to discover for yourself to repeat these experiments that the world is indeed round or that gravity does indeed exist. It's like the difference between if this, then that versus that. Teach a man to fish. And still, the, you know what I mean? the yeah. dangers like, of placing that, the, the rigid right. truth in science is like, uh, it's a great place to put it, but it's also something that needs to be able to be uh, let go of too to reach a new truth. If you look at archaeology, you have all these timelines that, like, the more is discovered, the more fucked up they they have it. But right. they're trying to cling to these timelines and stuff that uh, are just growing more and more less true, or you know, like, uh, uh, like, like they're constantly more being evidence, redefined. Yeah, right. The more evidence that is unearthed. The timelines are wrong. So it's also the beauty of science is that you stand 
to make a career for yourself if you can prove someone else wrong. Right. Mm. So you have to always be challenging conceptions. You have yeah. to always be admitting we don't know and asking questions. If As soon as it becomes rigid and you say this issue is closed forever, then it ceases to be science. You're about to be wrong. Right. Yeah. I I thought when you, when you were talking about like religion and dogma and ancient more ancient ways of knowing and mystics and stuff, when I was reading up on astral projection specifically, I thought it was fascinating that it exists in some form in most ancient cultures. Mm. Yeah. I like thought... This is not at all a new concept and not at all a Western concept. Mm-hmm. Like the ancient Egyptians had an Escapism. idea of, of the soul or the they call it the ka that w- could move and did move independently of your physical body. And they would de- depict it as like the, when they would, uh, depict images of kings or important people, there would be two of them to represent that they had a, a physical body and a, a spirit or like a ethereal body. Um, and the, the, the word literally translates to double. <laughs> hey, there it goes again. Right. Yeah. Whoa. And the, uh, the, the Taoist alchemists from, uh, however, BC for sure, probably thousands of years, had... Uh, Before Chris. <laughs> yes. Before cats. <laughs> <laughs> Prior to cats. So pre-Egyptian. Uh, no, they, they had a process of creating what they called an energy body. So basically the same idea. You could, through meditation and breathing techniques, you could, uh, you could create this second version of yourself that could then function independently of yourself. Or the uh, the idea of uh, uh, I think it's a Buddhist concept originally of the the tulpa that you can create a physical form from your thoughts that if you focus enough mental energy on an idea on a concept that it can manifest in our physical reality and there are all these different all these different versions of the same idea going back as far as we can trace back humans. And so when we talk about science, yeah, we didn't have scientific method. We didn't have our current understanding of the world. And yet this idea persisted and was known across the world. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, think of like, uh, you know, the practice of like yoga, asana, like physical stuff. This, This had like anatomical understanding long before they were dissecting people to figure this stuff out, you know, like. Right. And they understood a lot of things that had different definitions, obviously, but they had like stuff that now science is catching up to, to be able to prove these benefits and everything, but it existed 5,000 years ago. It didn't make the practice. And they knew it. They didn't need to have it proven. Right. right? Or it was proven and understood through a different process. Different language, more like a language that was less... uh, scientific and more artistic and you know the and art I think, science i of think it. that's okay that that certain worlds catch up to each other totally because there's other things that were understood thousands of years ago that are just flat wrong you know? right like that the earth <laughs> right. is flat Plenty of them. Yeah. killing virgins will help you grow your crops i mean certain things that ancient knowledge isn't necessarily Perfect. good just because it's ancient right you know certain things survive and are usable and certain things get you know right redacted which is a good thing totally yeah. Icurio. Translates to living ghost in Japanese. Whew. Whoa. Same idea that you could manifest a, a second version of yourself to go do things on your behalf. So, like, I liked how you're talking about Egyptians. This subtle energy understanding, like, have you heard the theories about, like, the use of the great pyramids, the pyramids yeah. of Giza and stuff? They weren't tombs, but they're rather electrical vessels. They're made with an understanding of electricity, with like... Flash magnetism. Yeah, like water running underneath stones, underneath the pyramids. They Vibes, it, dude. They insulate it. Yeah, so like... They, Tesla, baby. They made the, built this whole thing to basically, um, according to the people that live in Egypt, like the, the word of mouth story that was passed down, oral history, is that the big one was meant... Like monks were in this place that has like harmonic chambers and shit. Mm-hmm. And they're just basically like oming or like humming and creating these frequencies Resonant frequencies and people would go in there and they would heal they'd be healed through subtle energy and that's it's like when you start viewing the world is like we don't really know what they had you know and like it's right. in like history again it's that arrogance right i was gonna right. say history like it might have been five thousand years ago they might have understood something and like only a thousand years ago that 
was completely buried and then a, a new mm-hmm. more like dogmatic thing was put in place you know like mm-hmm. cuz that's we tend to think that our, like our idea of advancement like an advanced society is tied in with like the light bulb and screens and vehicles and internal combustion Because the only way and, we can see it, it's the only way we know how to measure it, but it doesn't mean that we are living at the most technologically advanced or just, you know, advanced, whatever technology means to you. Mm-hmm. It's like there could have been alternate, it's, it's basically a lot of unknown and imperialism and colonialism and stuff that like intentionally erases like, to know, make us believe if, right now is the, the best place been to built live. in France, we would have a totally different idea about mm. what they did. Right. <laughs> Those Africans weren't advanced. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a big part of it, uh-huh. honestly. No, I mean, I know I'm saying. That is, uh, yeah. So it's kind of having a less rigid understanding of, truth <laughs> or like definitions i guess well, like, yeah again it comes back to language because even what does advanced mean right yeah exactly right, right? like that we think of it us. in terms of it just means us in terms of technology and the ability to manipulate our environment but that's that's not really working out for i was us. gonna say yeah <laughs> how's that doing yeah i'm yeah, having right. a massive question. deja vu right now oh yeah whoa was it the paranormal is happening in this room <laughs> right now? <laughs> Sorry, I had to blow that up by saying that, but I was—it was like freaking me out. I was like, "Whoa, we've done all of this to the word." <laughs> we've, we've probably had that exact what, conversation what, maybe, before the that, four of us. That's actually possible. What was it that you just said about advancement? Oh, or, that there's uh, <sighs> just how you define advanced probably has has changed throughout time, and that we we would describe that as, uh, you know, our use of technology and our ability to manipulate our environment and our surroundings. But that that's one version of advance. And in a lot of ways, that shit's not really working. Yeah, think a lot. It's not sustainable, you know? That's an interesting, uh, thinking about evolution, that we, like, we like to pat ourselves on the back for being, like, advanced. And we like to think of evolution as, like, a ladder that ultimately led to us, you know? Mm -hmm. Because we have a robot who can vacuum our floors. Right. But if, if our most advanced trait which is like intelligence and cultural memory and the ability to like stand on the shoulders of giants and what have you if that ultimately ends up being our downfall then that then what really is advanced was a terrible trait to develop right. yeah that's yeah. not that's not advancement yeah that was that was our downfall right was our advancement <laughs> and right looking back through history and stuff like the maya you know and the when the uh europeans discovered uh like I, I believe wait, I'm thinking of anyways, when they when the Europeans discovered the Americans in like Central America with these huge empires, the Aztecs, the Mayans, they had the cleanest cities. There there's the biggest populations in the world at the time. Uh, Mexico City was larger than like Rome. It's just huge, like amazing uh, understandings of time and calendars and mathematics and stars and pyramids and agriculture yeah agriculture and all this shit and it was it was basically better in a lot of ways than what europe was doing but they're also sacrificing like tens of thousands of people to like spill their blood in the temples to keep the sun moving across the sky maybe that was our downfall man we stopped sacrificing people maybe we need to go back to it but still less people (laughs) i was gonna say it was was better living it was better living than more population Right. See? As if we're not still sacrificing people. Yeah. Well, no, I, I agreed. Yeah, and, and <laughs> that's to say, who's to say, days, who's right. to say we're doing so much better, you know? Yeah, at least they yeah. gave them a ceremony. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of the people that live at the top they, they of thought this, they were helping. this pyramid, you know, like ourselves that can appreciate like of like all sorts of, uh, you know, commodity and comfort and shit. That comes We're like sacrifice. depressed, you know, like we're not, not happy by, you know, it's like doesn't necessarily, it's not easy to count your blessings being on this, a plane of like uh you know grocery store you can get mangoes in december and shit it's like what is advanced what does it mean well now that we're nowhere close to our original topic yeah that was that, that, that was a we still are, though. wild yeah. it was a ride we, we, we took it there ride. boys we, <laughs> we did her bud we're not we even did stoned we she's goose there <laughs> she's all goosed <laughs> uh that's probably a good place to to wrap it for now yeah i think it is i think it is uh mace dog this has been fun 
yeah. chance. Appreciate you, you. Thank you, guys. Love y'all, too. I Thanks really for love, being here. Everyone is listening, too. Love you guys. Yeah, yeah we you do don't know too. that. There's Honestly, probably some uh, fucked up people out there. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Except for, what's her name in Tulsa, Oklahoma? <laughs> yeah, where's she from? The diner. Amy? <laughs> yeah. All right, Amy. Amy in the diner in Oklahoma. Yeah, you suck, Oh, no, we, I don't know who the lady is who thought your voice sucked. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah. She doesn't count. Yeah, that lady, no. She probably My died. apologies for, like, a knee-jerk reaction. Maybe I was she, a little offended. Maybe she is a crackhead, okay. and that's, like, a compliment. Yeah, I was going to say, maybe you just hang out with too many drunk crackheads. You know what I'm saying? Sorry, sorry. I remind you of something you know. Okay. Uh, we do love y'all. Uh, thank y'all for listening. Send us an email if you want. Hi at whatifpodcast.com. You can comment yeah. on uh, the rest of our voices if you feel uh, if you feel so inclined. Uh, <laughs> there's also um, a survey we have at whatifpodcast.com/survey. Um, it just tells us a little bit about our listeners. And every week, damn, there's a lot more of you. So thank y'all so much for listening. We really do love y'all in the same way that. Uh, that, that Mason uh, mentioned that he loved y'all. Uh, one, or I guess two more quick ways that y'all can support if you want. Uh, go take that survey, but also uh, we have a Patreon set up. You can we get sure to the do. Patreon from our website. Uh, or patreon.com slash whatifpodcast. That as well. Uh, Mason is drinking out of one of the dope, dope, dope mugs you can get by being a sporter. Um, some they of this hold episode. up to 16 ounces of whiskey or yeah. most They're other beautiful. liquids. There you go. Um, some, uh, some of actually this episode will be uh, delivered to our Patreon supporters. Thank you all so much for being those people uh, in video form, which we haven't done a lot of, but um, you can kind of see the four of us hanging out in a room, uh, chalk and shop. Um, and uh, yeah, one more time. Thank you all so much for supporting. And We're all the fully ways that nude, you do. by the way. <laughs> so if you sign up for Patreon, you'll sign get, up for our you, Patreon. You, you'll get that perk and our unlimited nude Snapchat. <laughs> <laughs> if you're uh, anywhere in the Midwest and want to hang out with with me and Chance on Friday, you can come to Somerset Music Festival and we'll, we'll play rap songs for you. Oh bye, yeah, bye, bye, bye. also yeah. fully nude. Yes, also uh-huh. fully nude. No pants whatsoever. From now on, look, if I don't need clothes in the astral plane, I don't need them in real life either. We're, we're done Bingo. with Bingo. <laughs> and with that. Everyone was pretty ugly, but it was still a pretty good time. <laughs> Love you. Bye. We'll be back next week with another episode of the What If Podcast. Learn more at www.whatifpodcast.com.